welcome to Mountain Valley Today. We're certainly glad you've chosen to tune in and join us. Today I've got a young man. I'm going to call you young man. Is I that appreciate okay? that. You're man. most welcome. Yeah. His name is Wade Hill, and he is running for city council in Fort Payne. So, Mr. Hill, it's so nice to meet you and appreciate you being on our show well, today. Thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we just met just a few minutes ago, uh, but I have learned already I'm supposed to call him Mr. Hill. When you hear his resume, you will understand why. So, Mr. Hill, I'm going to start with you and just say, why in the world do you want to run for city council of Fort Payne? I got that right off the bat, just as soon as I talked to some people about uh, about venturing off into this. I've, I've been around city government, county government, state government all my life, but I've never been a, a politician as such. I've worked for the government. I started out in 1978 as a volunteer fireman, got a job as a dispatcher with the city, stayed there 29 years and retired as the fire chief. During that tenure, I spent 11 years as the fire marshal, so I had the fire and the you know, the law enforcement background right, going on at right. the same time. I was also an EMT intermediate, so I was a police officer, a firefighter, and a medic all at the same time. <laughs> you wore so many hats, you I didn't had, know who you were that I day. had several different hats and badges, <laughs> but I enjoyed that time with the city. It was, it was a great part of my life, and then after 29 years, I retired from the city, went to work for Sheriff Jimmy Harris as his commander of the Major Crimes Unit. So there, I basically uh, organized and and created the major crime unit within the sheriff's office, which was just basically formerly the investigators. Right. But we expanded on that, combined our forces with the drug unit, and, and went after actual major crimes, homicides, major drug crimes, and major felony cases. We worked those very hard for eight years, had some great success, and, and did a good job there. Then I had an opportunity to, to leave there after eight years and uh, left that in capable hands of Josh York. He's now the chief investigator for the sheriff and Josh is doing a good job there. But I went to work for Mike Odell, the district attorney, who I had known most of my life and had worked with for several years. Uh, I first worked with Mike when he was the assistant district attorney because he would prosecute my arson cases when right. I was a fire marshal. Right. So we got along great and been friends for years. And, an opportunity came about where I could go to work for him, so now I'm his criminal investigator. So I follow up on uh, murder cases, death investigations, and try to work with families to help them get through the process of going through the criminal element of their, their loved one who was murdered or whatever, and, and try, to, try to make life as, as good as I can for people that are in terrible circumstances. Well, I can tell you just from hearing that, working for the city government and all those different aspects and county government, uh, man, you're the one I want on my side. Well, I, I hope so. I, <laughs> I think I bring a good bit to the table. I've, I've been to council meetings for years and commission meetings. I was the liaison between the sheriff's office and the commission, and I had a great relationship with, with those guys. They, they did a good job of helping support the sheriff's office and, and improve things there. And so I've, I've been around city government. I went to council meetings for years as the assistant chief. I handled the budgetary end of the fire department for Chester Harrison and then when I became chief I, I did all the interaction between the council so I understand what it's like to be a department head having to interact with a council and now I may reverse that role and be a council member interacting with a department head so I, I bring that to the table and just uh, I've got a lot of experience in public government and, and public safety. Well and that's one thing about getting involved with uh, city government that was huge for me. I had, I had worked for the city in the summer as a seasonal employee for 11 years, uh, but you've been working 29 as the, in the fire department, EMT, yep. all those kinds of things. So you understand even more um, the workings of the finances and how you have to go about uh, getting things done because uh, city government is not anything like your personal finances? Oh no, no. When I was fire chief, uh, I had to develop a budget, work with the council and the, and the treasurers and the financial people and, and get to the point where I could explain to them why I needed two and a half million dollars a year to operate my department. Right. And uh, that's not an easy task when money's tight. But I developed those programs, I developed long and short range plans and, and that was one of the first things we did years ago was start planning for what we're going to do five years from now. And that's what I feel like was very important in Fort Payne right now is we've kind of weathered the storm economically, 
but we've got to plan 5, 10, 15, 20 years out so that my grandchildren have a better opportunity to stay in Fort Payne or come back and visit or, or at least have that opportunity. I, right. want, I want our next generation to benefit from what we do right now. And to be a visionary in our in our current time, a lot of people don't get that. They don't under they they just want to be worried about today. A lot of people don't want change. Right. But you're you're a wise individual to realize <laughs> there's a future beyond today, and you've got to prepare for it. That's Rather it. Rather than react, you need to be proactive in your approach. There's such a large segment of the population now, and particularly some of the younger people, that this literally live for now, mm -hmm. and they've got to get through this day and this week. But I'm to the point in my life, I'll be 58 years old in December. I've got grandchildren, and my children are grown and having their own families now, and I want them to be able to benefit from things on down the road that we do now, because if we don't do some things right now, uh, that's not going to be there for them. Yeah. We just, we've got we to gotta stay the course financially, but there's things we can do right now that may take a few years to, to reach fruition, but they're going to be beneficial to the next generation. Well, one thing I always like to uh, ask the, the candidates who are running for government office to come in and tell us about them. You know, something about you. A lot of times people may know you as the fire chief. They may know you working in the uh, uh, county or whatever role you may be in. But tell us about your family and where you grew up and, uh, you know, what's going on with, with the private. Right. Well, my, my life started early in city government, if you want to call it that, because my grandfather, my father's father, was the jailer and custodian for the city hall in Fort Payne. My grandmother cooked the meals for the inmates. And I grew up in Fort Payne in those days, the fire department, the police department, the street department, the water department, everybody was in the old city hall building. It was built in the 40s for a public municipal complex. So I literally played in the, in the basement with my grandparents where they lived. <laughs> I would go upstairs and play on the fire trucks or play with a policeman or I made great friends as a young man and then when they would bring in a bad person we were always told to go downstairs and they would let us know when the coast was clear because they didn't want the kids upstairs when they'd bring a drunk in or something and, and back then it was like a rowdy town drunk. It wasn't the people trying to blow you up and kill you now. It was just somebody that had had too much to drink and they didn't want the kids to see that. So we were sheltered from that. but. I would also get to go in the jail with my grandfather and feed the inmates with their wow. little plastic school tray and slide it under their door. And I, I learned early on that I did not want to be on the other side of that <laughs> door. And I think that's why they did that. They wanted to instill in me that this is not what you want to aspire to do. You can do better than this. And so when I got old enough to get a job, uh, you had to be 21 to be a police officer, but at 19 you could be a firefighter. So. I got in the fire service after a year of working out of town. I came back to town and got hired by Pete Leith in the fire department. And I worked my way up from a volunteer to a dispatcher to a firefighter, made lieutenant, captain, assistant chief, and then spent seven years as chief and then retired from that. But I married a, my, the love of my life who happened to be my boss's daughter. <laughs> Her dad, Milton Leith, was. Job security yeah, there. Okay. well, okay. He, her, her granddad was actually the chief that hired me. When, when I got hired in Fort Payne, I was kin to nobody there. And over the years, I wound up being kin to half the people in the fire department because <laughs> we all, small town, you just all get jobs where you can. And, and uh, so my wife, Cindy, and I had two children, John and Amy. John went to the Marine Corps after high school. And Amy Jo is a, currently a school teacher in Coosa. She lives in Fort Payne, but she drives back and forth. And John is back from the Marine Corps and has spent time as a police officer at the, he was actually a county deputy and a, a police officer at Fife for a while. He was a firefighter at Albertville for a little while. And now he's back in the military. He's in the 20 Special Forces Group stationed in Fort Payne. He's recently married again. He's got three beautiful little blonde headed daughters and then my daughter has another little girl, so I've got four little grandbabies from 14 months to 12 years. <laughs> so they keep me pretty busy. And, and they've got you right there? Exactly. That's, <laughs> I won't tell you, that's why I'm doing this, because I want them to be able to have things and do things someday uh, past the time when Pop can do anything for them. I want them to be able to benefit from and make Fort Payne even better than what it is right now as far as a place to live. Well, tell us some things that I know that when you get in city government, there is a, it's a team effort. You have to work together as right. a unit, and everybody's got their own 
I don't want to say agenda, but ideas right. of things to do. What are some of your ideas that you see in Fort Payne, Alabama that you can build upon and make better? I know you've got some. You've been there long enough. You ought to know there's some things you'd like to see happen that maybe have not. We've got, uh, we've got good infrastructure. We've got good finances. We've got good people there. The current mayor and council have done a good job. They've been financially responsible. But there's always a couple of things that you'd like to see done a little different or better. And I'd, I'd like to be able to put my perspective into that. But also, I realize that there's only so much you can do. You know, you've got a finite amount of money, and the city's got a rather large budget, but they, they are running currently a surplus, slight surplus, but it is a surplus. The schools have to be properly funded. Uh, in Fort Payne, the city school system is funded by a seven and a half mil property tax. It was voted in in the 50s. So they get three mils from the state, seven and a half mils from local property taxes. So Fort Payne is well funded by property tax, which is a better source of funding than sales tax anyway. Yeah. So we always hear, well, we got to give more money to the schools. Well, the schools are funded adequately right now, but there's always room for improvement. And I've said from the start, if there's a comprehensive plan put together jointly by the city and the school board that calls for more financing, we'll look at that, but we're not going to do it just to see if you can spend more money if we give it to you. Yeah. And I think anybody that's responsible in the school system would, would think that that would be the way to do that. Mm -hmm. I think we can all work toward a common goal. We just got to sit down and see what those goals are, what they're going to cost, and how we're going to take care of that. Because right now, the, the bond debt for the school system is on the city's books. A lot of people don't realize that, but the city actually owes right at $10 million in bond debt, which sounds like an astronomical number, but it's small relative to other cities yeah. our size. Yeah. And we'll be bond free in nine years. So there's some movement there, but four and a half million dollars of the city's debt right now is the school that was built you know, at, at Wills Valley. Mm -hmm. So if there's gonna be another school built, there's gotta be some funding for that. <laughs> That's probably gonna have to be a bond issue. Right. So. There's some discussion about how that bond issue is going to be done, whether the city does it or the school board. So there's a lot of hard decisions to be made in the next few years. And, and, and that, that's just growing pains. That's it is. Preparing for the future. It's a good problem to have, really. Yeah, 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 it really is. Well, I see you got some ideas about that. What are some, and I know you're very complimentary of the, the financial uh, stability and the infrastructure of the previous council. But what are uh, maybe some other things you think that maybe you've gone down a different route and you want to turn it a different way? Well, you know, there, there's quite a bit of talk right now about Fort Payne being designated as a Main Street community. And that's a great thing. That's a, that's a good deal. At face value, you try to figure out exactly what does that make us good, bad, or indifferent, you know. And, and it's an improvement. It's something that recognizes that we do have things going on. It gives us the ability to study and, and get data on what would help improve the, the Main Street downtown part. My only uh, disagreement with the Main Street is it seems to be kind of a smaller section. I know you have to start small, but to me, Main Street and Fort Payne is Y to Y. Yeah. It's not just the old downtown part. So when you encompass from Y to Y, there's quite a bit of things to be done. I think we can make Fort Payne a cleaner, better place. I think there needs to just be simple attention paid to intersections, litter, weeds, things like that that people drive into our town and see at first glance and it mm -hmm. forms an opinion. Yeah. So if first you can make it, are exactly, hard to exactly, 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 right. exactly. So if we can work on that a little bit, the Patriot Park project was started and then just died on the vine. I want to see that completed. I see no reason that that can't be completed in a, in a short time. If you get some highly motivated people involved in that, uh, I know it's been laid off on this, well, it's the VFW's deal, it's the city's deal, well, the county won't do this. I'm tired of the arguing and bickering about that. I think the city of Fort Payne needs to finish that park, and if they can get other people to come in and partner and help with the financing, there's all kind of ways to fund that. The simplest way, and I was part of this at the Alabama Fire College, they built a giant memorial down there, and they paid for it by selling bricks with people's names on it. And if you build it, they will come. <laughs> And if you put every service member in DeKalb County that wants to buy a brick for their family member, right. every EMT, every firefighter, every law enforcement officer, that's a lot of money in a short period of time. They just have to know where to go buy that brick and pay the money to. Mm -hmm. That's the problem right now. There's no way to receive that money. And I think we can put a committee together, and I think Tyler Wilkes is starting to head that program up right now. So I hope that project will be put on the front burner. It's not a big deal. 
but it's an important deal. Mm -hmm. If we're going to you know, do something that small and knock it out, then that shows people that we're serious about moving forward. The coal and iron building was bought years ago. A lot of money was used, a lot of grant money was used to restore it back to its original state. You know, that's the cornerstone of Fort Payne right there at 5th Street and Galt Avenue. The upstairs has never been finished. The downstairs is partially complete. It's being used quite a bit as an event venue. It's bringing in some revenue. It could be used more if it was finished mm -hmm. and a few little things done. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two office type buildings on the 5th Street side that could be cleaned out and utilized. And you could actually put a small welcome center office deal in one of those where somebody's there Monday through Friday where people from out of town can go in there and get information, do whatever. The people that run the theater need some office space. There's just a lot of things you can do there with yeah. that building. And just generally cleaning up town, working on some things. The, the big deal that I have brought up that's seemed to caught fire here lately is uh, it's been a passion of mine for years because I've been to so many wrecks at Joe's Truck Stop. I want to see that eliminated once and for all in my lifetime. And the way to do that is to partner with the state and use some state and federal money and take Highway 35 down through Joe's Truck Stop around and into the South Y like it was originally designed 35 years ago. That would entail an overpass over the railroad. Yeah, it's a $20 million, $30 million job. But if you get the right resources and the right motivation, that gives you a truck route around downtown, mm -hmm. lets you develop downtown as a business shopping district instead of a truck route. <laughs> it opens up more parking and driving abilities. Yeah. Down. It makes it a safer shopping venue by getting the truck traffic out of there. It gives you a 24-7 way to get over the railroad so you don't care if the train's parked there anymore. You can go over it 24-7, 365, and that's the way to go. The people that want to come into downtown and shop would have a safer environment to do it. The trucks go around town, you're over the railroad, so that's not an issue anymore. And guess what? The most deadly impediment to truck drivers in Alabama is gone once yeah. and for all. Well, see, I, I, I'm 54 and I have never, ever heard that that was originally intended to go a different route. My father-in-law lived down around Southeast Baptist Church. And he used to joke about every time they'd have a wreck at Joe's truck stop that killed somebody, which was pretty regular in the 60s and 70s. The state would come through and resurvey the route, and they would put the stobs in the yards out there next to his house. And then the neighbors a month later would go get the stobs and throw them away because they knew they wouldn't come back till the next wreck. So it's been surveyed probably 50 times over the years. Really? And with today's technology, uh, it would take some property away from some homeowners over there. But it's a, it's a part of town that I think that could be improved if we do this. Some of the street that's already uh, right away could be used. Mm -hmm. So there's property that would have to be taken. It would open up that whole alley of getting around town there with the trucks. You could come to the South Y and if you want to go up through town, you just turn left, drive up through there. The trucks keep going and get on out of town. And the trucks are not going to stop and shop in Fort Payne anyway. They're coming through there as quick as they can. It's just common sense. And it's slowing them down while they're trying to get to their next destination. Exactly, exactly. Wow, I had never heard that before. Um, well, I know that you're, uh, is your family on board with you doing this uh, bid for city council? Yes, and, and I'll be honest with you, my daughter has her baby, is 14 months old, Georgia Blue, is uh, on my campaign committee. And <laughs> one of the first things my daughter did was get Georgia and put her in a little chair in her front yard and put one of my signs up. And she's just got the biggest giggling grin with that vote for my pop deal. Uh, we just had some family photos made, and I'm not one to get out and, and use my family as a political ploy, but my family wants everybody to know that they're behind me, and, yeah. and I'm going to run an ad probably the week before election that's got my family all together, my children and their children, with the exception of my one granddaughter who lives in Nebraska, and it's going to say vote for Wade Hill, and, and they, they support me 100% because they know my passion for my hometown. I've been here... Uh, We've been here four generations now, and I want to have four more come through Fort Payne and call it home. There's just so much here that it just makes it such a great place to live. It's not Mayberry, but it's close as I want to get to Mayberry. I mean, you can, you see people you know, and and you greet people uh, all over town, and and that, that's the way I want it to be. I want everybody to be able to say, "Hey, how you doing?" and mean it. Yeah. You know. 
Well, one thing I've learned uh, in doing this particular show is there's such a neat area of things we take for granted. The state parks, the, the events, the different restaurants and business owners and activities that go on. So do you think that promotion is one of the key things that Fort Payne needs to do to help bring more and more people to town? That's probably one of the cheapest returns on dollar investments you can make right now. Uh, you've got DeSoto Falls, you've got the Scout Trail that connects it to the National Preserve. So you've got the ability to go kayaking, canoeing, hiking, rock climbing, rappelling, all this stuff. And my son has brought it to my attention. A lot of his friends from Chattanooga, they're in their 30s, and they work high-stress jobs, they make good money, and they like to play hard to de-stress. <laughs> so let them come down here and de-stress. And they're not a bunch of headbangers that uh, drink and I mean, they go climb rocks to yeah. de-stress. They they go ride mountain bikes, and mountain bikes is a big. Industry. It's a big deal. And let big me tell you industry. something. DeSoto Falls has the water backed up behind the dam to the point where you could work a mini triathlon, put people in there, let them swim upstream and back around buoys, come back out, get on a bicycle, ride that bicycle down to the trailhead at the DeSoto State Park Lodge, and then run from there down to the National Preserve. It's a mini triathlon. People pay to do that. They just have to have a place to do it. Somebody's got to organize that. You could make that a spring and a fall event that would bring in hundreds of people. And it's nothing but clean fun. And Well, that's exactly right. And someone to organize and promote it. Exactly. And there are people out there that do that. If they could have the ability to work with the state park and the National Preserve and use the scout trail, and then you could actually have people come in that would improve the scout trail to the point where you could actually run on it mm -hmm. and uh, I mean it's there we've got the re resources here we just got to be able to get people to them access them and promote it a little more well you know every time my family makes a trip to Gatlinburg I'm like why are we going to Gatlinburg exactly we have one of the most beautiful views around and one thing else I've learned is a lot of people come here to vacation out at the Mentone uh, Lookout Mountain area. They come here, they make their home because right. they love the, the area. I was talking to a friend of mine the other day that had lived away and has moved his family back because he said there's nothing like this sense of community we right. have here. Uh, and I, don't think, I think people sometimes who are here and never lived anywhere else, we don't appreciate what we have. You're right. You're exactly right. And we, we take it for granted. I mean, Little River Canyon has always been here for me. When people come here for the first time and see that, they're just amazed that this big secret is in North Alabama. And, and they don't realize that, hey, there's 13 miles of road that you can drive around and just stop and look at all the different places. And you can hike down in there. You can actually hike down in and go into Canyon Mouth Park in Cherokee County. You've got Weiss Lake on one side of us, Tennessee River on the other. I mean, we're in a perfect place. If you want to go do major water sports, you can be in Fort Payne, and in 30 minutes, you can be in either lake. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, we've got more than we know around here. We just got to be able to get other people to understand what we have here. And the interstate coming through town, I was anxious, or not anxious, but I was uh, surprised to learn that now there's some expansions to those motels going on yeah. in Fort Payne. Yeah, and, and, and hopefully, if, if all goes well, and you know as well as I do, businesses will flourish when they're at capacity. So if you got nine motels and they stay full, somebody's going to bed 10 and 11. <laughs> so our our, uh, our rate is pretty busy. During the day, people don't understand because they go by and there's not a lot of people there. People don't sleep there during the day, mm -hmm. you know? They're yeah. cleaning the rooms. You go by there at 11 or 12 o'clock at night and they're all packed. Mm -hmm. That's when you can understand the, the impact of people that stop here, eat here, spend a little money and then go on somewhere else. That's clean revenue. Well, what do you what do you think can be resolved with the traffic uh, at the south end next to the interstate where um, Cracker Barrel is? You know that area, four, five o'clock <laughs> is a nightmare. Oh, I'm gonna tell you. I, I worked at sheriff's <laughs> office for eight years, and I can tell you every day at the end of the day when you go north to go home, it got to where I would go out Lebanon Road and through the south why it was quicker. The problem there is you've got a major intersection. The road coming down Airport Road, you get there and you've got a left turn lane, a straight, and a right. But you're looking at a two lanes across from you. Mm -hmm. And people over there don't understand how to turn left into the near lane while people over there turn. It's just a lack of education there. But if you had a designated turn lane where you had a green arrow 
that would tell them to go <laughs> and they could safely do that, that would help. That's going to come over and crowd the Hardy's parking lot out. There's some major utilities there that have to be relocated and the state of Alabama is going to have to do the job. So that's a joint city state venture there. DOT's got to come in there, engineer that intersection and that's probably the biggest trouble spot in traffic in Fort Payne right now. The other end of Airport Road actually needs a traffic device mm -hmm. because when everybody on Airport Road goes north to Highway 11, turning right is fine, but if you want to turn left, you've got three lanes of traffic coming into two there, so that's a traffic control issue that right. they, they need to look at, and I, I, that's down the road, but it's something that I think has been discussed and needs to be discussed further. So both ends of Airport Road are problematic. The south end is the nightmare. I mean, <laughs> it, it locks everything in Fort Payne down at certain hours of the day. Yeah, you yeah. can't get in or out of town because of that intersection. You're stuck right there. You're stuck. Well, one of the things you mentioned a couple of times is working with state uh, DOT. And, you know, as a legislator, we have some in our area that we work with. How do you think your relationship with the state senators and the House of Representatives delegation will help uh, you get some of those things done in Fort Payne? I think that would be great because Steve Livingston is uh, – he is wide open for a first-term senator. Steve's a Scottsboro boy. Uh, I actually was in a court case one time when his dad was, he was one of the lawyers. So I, <laughs> I know Steve is a businessman from Scottsboro and he's got a lot of the same drive issues that we've got on this side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. He wants things to do good over there. But the thing that's great about it right now is we've had some great senators and some great representatives. I don't know that we've ever had a time like we've got right now where our representative and our senator are seen together more than I've ever seen. If you see Steve, you see Nathaniel. Yeah. And Nathaniel, has, uh, he's done a good job. He's going to be doing a good job for the next two years, and I hope to see he and Steve reelected and go to Montgomery and gain some momentum because yeah. first-term guys don't usually get a lot done, but these two guys are known in Montgomery already, and if we can keep them in Montgomery, working with Fort Payne, Scottsboro, Rainsville, and everything in between, I think we've got a uh, great potential there. I've already talked with both of them about this issue with the road down there. They've been very receptive to that and very positive. They've actually talked to some of the folks at DOT already about that. So I'm excited that we've got the potential to take what was a pipe dream and make it a reality. And if it's 20 years out, at least we'll know when it's going to get done. Yeah. Well, we just have a, a minute or two left. If there's somebody that's watching today and they're like, I just don't really know who to vote for, look at that viewer and just in the 30 seconds, tell them why you're the man. You're the one they need to click the, bu the box for. Well, I've lived in Fort Payne all my life. I've worked in public safety for 38 years. I've spent my whole career helping people. I want to continue to help people. And I want to be able to do that in a position where I can help larger groups of people. And I'd like to be able to take my experience and what I've done and what I've learned, the people I know, the things that I've learned over the years, and sometimes it's not always what you want to do. <laughs> but uh, I'm, for, I'm for the, let's do the mostest that we can do with the leastest. And then if you get more, you can always expand on that. But uh, I love Fort Payne, I love DeKalb County, I love Alabama. Uh, it's my home, it's where I've been, it's where I'm gonna stay. I wanna keep my family here. And I want to make it the best possible place that, that my grandkids can grow up in. Well, I, I tell you, this is the first time I've met Mr. Hill, and I, I'm impressed. I've enjoyed getting <laughs> to spend a little time with you today. And we appreciate you watching Mountain Valley today. Don't forget you can watch any episode on mountainvalleynewspaper.com. You can also see us on Farmers Telephone TV Channel 6 and also on WFPA 1400 AM in Fort Payne. Thank you so much, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.